Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming on this beautiful day. It is uh, February 27th. And this is the February meeting of the Regional Housing Committee. Um, call the meeting to order. And it is three minutes after two. You got that? Yeah. All right. One more call the vote. Sure. Um, from Chester in the room, we have Pat Bands and Bonnie Bennett. From Clinton, Abby Pearson. Here with us. Um, Michael from Portland. Sound is going in and out. Everyone. Okay. How about now? Can you hear us now? No. Bear with us a second. We'll get it fixed. We can hear some words, just not all of them. Um, and we do have, we do have a couple of guests here today. So um, why don't we just go around and go ahead, Beth? You can introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Beth Sibili. I'm the director of the Center for Housing Equity and Opportunity, Eastern Connecticut. Name again. Beth. Sibelia, and it's the Center for Housing Equity and Opportunity, Eastern Connecticut, <clears throat> CHEO. Oh, and for everyone that's here, um, David R., maybe you can pass down the um, agendas and the handouts that are right there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank that's you. I appreciate that. So all three of us have them here. Okay. Do you have, do you have one, Michael? The agenda? Yeah, I have it. Yeah. And... <laughs> Jeff DeWigo is here with us today. Hi, um, my name is Jeff DeWigo. I'm actually a candidate for the 33rd Senate District. I have uh, many years of public housing experience, uh, both on the environmental engineering side, as well as dealing with uh, HUD regulations, uh, rent subsidies, the whole gamut. Um, so uh, my, my recent claim to fame is the uh, affordable housing building that was built for Aaron Stewart in New Britain at the entry to the busway to Hartford on Columbus Boulevard. Now they have somewhere to go. Thank you. Running again for Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then also in the room, me, Eliza Lopresti, and Marcos Gonzalez, River Cog staff. Um, and online we have uh, Carol Jones, first selectman of Deep River. Um, Zoe Chatfield, if you want to say hi, it looks like you're from Taiki, probably representing most of our towns. <laughs> hi, yes, uh, my name is Zoe. I am here from Taiki Planning Policy Group, and yeah, I'm here also um, on behalf of Deep River and Chester. Great, thank you. Um, and I see Carla Lindquist and Kara Capone. If, if either or both of you want to say hi and introduce yourselves, that would be great. Hi, Kara Capone with um, Mercy Housing and Shelter. And Carla is from Hope. I think everybody knows Carla. And uh, I see Mark has joined us from Middletown and Eric from Westbrook. All right. And thanks, Kara and, and Carla, for uh, pretending to join us. Okay, first up on the agenda is approval of the minutes from January 23rd. For uh, discussion purposes, I'll look for a motion to approve. Motion. Also, Oh. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Corrections? Additions? Okay, hearing none, we can go to a vote. All in favor of approving the minutes from January 23rd, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Can you guys hear us, Megan? It's okay? Okay, thank you. Nice. Okay. That was a nice quick trip through the housekeeping portion, and we can move on to uh, the highlight of our 
agenda today. We are very fortunate to have Beth Sevilla, who is the director of uh, the Center for Housing Equity and Opportunity of Eastern Connecticut with us. Um, just about a year old now, right? Now? Um, at the end of March. Right about. March? Yeah, end of March. So, so almost first, a year. Coming up on the first birthday. Yeah. I'm going to give a just a really abbreviated introduction to Beth because uh, if I gave you the, her, oh. her full resume, uh, she wouldn't be able to make her three o'clock Zoom meeting that she has to make. But um, Beth has been very active in southeastern Connecticut for a, a number of years. Um, she was a two term mayor of the city of New London, six terms. Uh, yeah, six terms on six the city council. Six years on city council. City yeah. council. Yeah. Uh, chaired the EDC Economic Development um, for more than four years. Liaison to Redevelopment Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, served on the New London Board of Ed. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> numerous volunteer activities. I'm, just, I'm 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 lifting from your from your bio. <laughs> I'm, on I'm the, guessing on the, that on the on the Chio site. <laughs> Uh, suffice to say, Beth, Beth has uh, a wealth of experience, and I uh, I miss the Waterford part of it too. So, um, so uh, a year ago, just about a year ago, the the center was established um, based on the the uh, Community Foundation of Southeastern Connecticut. And correct me if I get into this wrong, but um, and now I'm going from memory, which yeah. is it's a it's a partnership of seven not-for-profits in in the southeastern Connecticut region. Um, I can't rattle all of them off, but I'm, you might you might get to that when mm -hmm. you talk about uh, what you do. And subsequent to that, which happened, I believe, in February, if I remember correctly, uh, Beth was was appointed as its first and so far only director. And uh, I'm not going to preview anything, but I know you could you could uh, occupy a lot of time with all the activity that's been going on. And I'll just end the introduction with a personal note and say that I've had the, the privilege of, of being able to sit with Beth and just share ideas and, and hear her thoughts and, and uh, be the beneficiary of her expertise. And um, I think we're, we are all in for a very enlightening conversation with Beth today. And I, I, I very much appreciate you being here, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You're, I'm, I feel myself blushing, which is hard for somebody that collects elected offices, right? I mean, I just, when you were talking about that other people knit, I tended to run for a municipal office. So that's was my hobby um, and really where I found a lot of passion. So by training, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I practiced real estate and probate law in New London for the last 27 years. It, I was primarily a solo practitioner for many of those years. So small individual representation of regular folks when they were buying, selling, uh, facing foreclosure, needing to do workouts some commercial loans, a lot of planning and zoning work. Um, and I found myself wanting to focus on systems change. And as a practicing lawyer, you change someone's maybe day or year or the trajectory of what happens for the rest of their life in case of a, a purchase or a sale. But it wasn't the same sort of systems change that I was seeing as necessary in my practice. So what would that look like? That would look like an older, say an older widow living on $1,800 a month in Social Security, facing a $1,200 a month rent bill, you know, $200 um, additional medical, you know, co-pays and everything else. They don't always know about all the benefits available to them, but they're certainly not making it and they know that they worked all their lives and they're not making it. Um, same with same with people entering the workforce. They say, you know, I've come out, I've done what I'm supposed to do, I've either been trained to get a job or I've gone on to school and I can't find a home in the community where I grew up, where I want to live near my folks or my friends or my doctors. So I was seeing that repeatedly throughout my practice. And when this position came up, I will I will say this, Michael, um, I, the, the job description came up and it, it printed it out and I let it sit on my desk for about six weeks. And I kept picking it up and putting it down and saying, wow, this is a huge challenge. Um, I'm not sure that one person is up for the challenge. And what I didn't understand was that I had those seven partners in the center. Eastern Connecticut is the third center for housing opportunity in the state of Connecticut. The first one was in Fairfield County. Fairfield County Center for um, Housing Opportunity kicked off about three years ago, followed by the Litchfield County 
um, Center for Housing Opportunity. The Litchfield County Center is overseen by a former COG person, um, Jocelyn Ayers. So they're doing work up in the Northwest Hills that's radically different than the work that's being done in Fairfield. And it's different than the work that's being done in Eastern. We did just kick off um, in March. I took the, the end of March of last year, I took the reins as the full-time director. But prior to that, there were seven nonprofits that said, we want that CHO model in Eastern Connecticut. So it was this, my employer is the housing collective out of Bridgeport. The local partners are the Community Foundation for Eastern Connecticut is one of our strongest supporters locally. The United Way of Eastern Connecticut, Connecticut College, Eastern, Eastern Connecticut State University, RPA Regional Plan Associates, and the Partnership for Strong Communities. So the RPA piece, they're heavy on the planners, right? They've got a bunch, that's what they do. They're, they're urban planners. So we rely on them when we go for best practices and the like you know, just to get an initial look. The Partnership for Strong Communities does statewide advocacy. I'm focused on local advocacy, like going to planning and zoning, going to chief elected officials and talking to them, going to planners. I'm seeing Abby on the call. Abby was the planner in Waterford um, when I was there, and I will say this, um, she was one of our best <laughs> department heads, bar none. I mean, just just great to work with. Um, so, so we want to take the conversation around housing from say where I live in Waterford to where someone lives in Groton and have a regional conversation about best practices and to look at the regional housing needs. So Megan and Sam has been on, we have, we have kicked off, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit, but this summer we kicked off a regional housing needs assessment. There are a lot of different housing needs assessments. This one is just for the Eastern region of Connecticut, includes Tallinn, Wyndham and New London counties. And as you all know, the COGS borders don't all align to those counties or, you know, they have these things called county equivalents now. So Lower River COG is sitting there with two towns in the CHEO region. But because those towns are impacted by the entire, you know, southeastern part of Connecticut, we need representation from River COG, but at Lower River COG, but at the same time, there are only two towns for Lower River Cog and CHEO region. So as we sat down at, at a data table, we have a data advisory team that is made up of all four COGS, Capital Region COG, Lower River COG, Southeastern Connecticut, Council of Governments, and Northeast. We sat down and we realized, well, if we want Capital Region there, and if we want Lower River there, we want to also be a resource to them. So while only Lyme and Old Lyme are in CHEO's region, the housing needs assessment is going to cover all of River Cogs area. Mm -hmm. So that when you're going into an online data tool, sure, you can look at Lyme, you can look at Old Lyme, but you can also look at your COG. You can pull those towns out of your COG too and look at, say, Westbrook. It may not be the CHEO region, but it certainly impacts CHEO and it's a resource to those that are willing to sit at the table with us to oversee the collection of that data. So that, that kicked off this summer. I want to step back. Um, I joined in March. Uh, we launched late March at Connecticut College. And as a result of that launch, we created three work groups that have about 100 people involved in those various work groups, leaving aside the housing needs assessment. We have narrative change work group, we have preservation and protection, and we have capacity building and production. So we have three tables that I convene once a month to talk to people throughout the region, you know, people all the way up to you know, the, the mass border or sitting at this table about what we can do, say, for narrative change in the Eastern region. I just stopping there because in January 2024, we did release a narrative change playbook for the Eastern region and how to talk about housing and increased housing opportunities. We've all been at the tables where we hear someone say, but there'll be more kids, right, in the schools and we can't afford that. So it points you to the data and how you can reframe that conversation and pivot away from those harmful narratives. So that was um, done over the summer. We have about 35 people on that narrative change um, work group. They met with Dr. Tiffany Manuel from the Casemate. The Casemate has done narrative change work and um, you know, kind of play making for lack of case making, for lack of a better term throughout the country. They sat down and heard what these advocates had to say and then we deployed 
a um, survey and it went out to over 20,000 people. Let me pause. We only got about 200 responses, despite the fact that it went out to about 20,000 people, which is always a challenge. You guys all are shaking your head like you know. Um, so it's it was a challenge. But we took that, we asked for narrative responses to housing in Eastern Connecticut. And what we found was different than what we found in Litchfield. You know, there's a deep suspicion of government in Eastern Connecticut. Say in Litchfield, somebody will pick up the phone and call, you know, their chief elected official because they have a different they they have a different relationship to what government looks like in Eastern Connecticut. And, and I don't know if you see it here in Lower River, but in, in Eastern Connecticut, we got a hard back. Don't tell don't have Hartford tell us what to do. Don't um, don't have government try and fix things. They always mess things up. No one listens to us in Hartford anyway, so what's the point? You know, that kind of almost defeatist, like stay out of my business um, attitude. But they also said things like, gee, I wish my grandchildren could live here. I wish my mother could move out of that three bedroom, two story colonial. I wish we had more options as I age, as me and my husband age. So we took that kind of aspirational language and worked with that to work on how we frame this narrative in Eastern Connecticut. We don't want to say in Eastern Connecticut that this government program is a great thing and it's going to fix things because that's not what the community is interested in and that's not what they're engaged in. So that was released in, in January as a culmination of working with our stakeholders and then getting as much feedback as we could. We developed the playbook and then a, a toolkit as well. Uh, when you've been in, in meetings, there are people that come in and they don't know how to speak to a planning and zoning board. They just don't even know where the sign up sheet is, right? They don't know to keep it under three minutes. They don't know to have two points to speak on. So it, it really kind of details what you can do. There's actually a piece in there how to create a TikTok video. I've never in my life created a TikTok video, but I'm hoping somebody does, right? So that so that this conversation gets through all mediums. But if somebody's interested, they you can you can be interested, but if you don't have the tools and how do you talk to your planning and zoning commission, it doesn't make a difference, right? It, as to how to sign up. So that was also part of the narrative change work that we did. The housing needs assessment I talked about, the work groups I talked about, the other thing that may be of interest to you, and Michael was there. I know, I don't know, Megan, if you were there. At Connecticut College, we had a convening. CHEO with Desegregate Connecticut uh, looked at the affordable housing plans in New London County. And as you know, or as you may know, um, Department of Housing issued a best practices book about what you should do when you're implementing your affordable housing plan or what a town could consider, what, you know, what it should do, what best practices would be. So we took the plans as written and we compared them to the DOH guidelines and developed a scorecard that says you did, you know, five houses, you hit all five houses, we used houses as the, as the grades on DOH's plan, and that's the plan that you developed, and congratulations, you follow DOH's recommendations. Since then, um, you know, that New London, let me just let me just talk about New London. New London got a C, right? New London has 22.6% affordable housing stock. So the mayor called me and said, what are you doing giving us a C? We have more affordable housing stock than, you know, those people in East Lyme. And I, I said, that's that's not what we graded you on. It, it's not it's not how well you actually perform in the field. It's how you measured up to DOH's guidelines. I don't know if that's fair or not. You know, I I, I don't know, and I'm willing to get feedback from municipal officials. But there had to be some guideline given to municipalities. You don't just enact a statute and say create an affordable housing plan, and then not give any support either through best practices or in some cases through grant money to hire a consultant. So we, we have those affordable housing score cards. Now what do we do with them? So you, you scored us, now what? At the end of December, I applied for, CHEO applied for a grant from the Connecticut Project. The Connecticut Project is a philanthropy that focuses on systems change. And we asked for a multi-year grant and were awarded a multi-year grant to help provide capacity and assistance to towns, COGS, planners, nonprofits, um, to get them moving on production of housing. That's, uh, we're here, we're hiring a regional planner. Um, we, it's up on Indeed, and I shared it with our data advisory team. We are hiring a regional planner 
we're hiring a project manager. Our focus is going to be for the first year on assisting New London County towns in implementing the affordable housing plan, not just to implement them. It's to get houses built, right? So it's to implement and to see more production. So ideally, the CHEO will assist about 300 units in New London County this year. Um, that's our goal. And I'll report back to you next January about how we did. Uh, next year, we're going to be looking at, at Wyndham County and then moving up into Tallinn County as well. So I wanted to get thoughts, feedback. You're all kind of um, taking in a lot of information and I'm talking way far too much. So I would much rather hear from what people have to say about what CHEO is doing. I'm just curious. I didn't see your scorecard. If no one thing got a C, I'm guessing most of the other towns got Fs. No, no. And it was, and it was, it was the guidelines were like, did you deploy a survey? of your residents. Some towns didn't, some towns did. I know Waterford did. Abby was the planner during our affordable housing plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did. Well, we did it, River Cog. Mm -hmm. River Cog did it. So there are municipalities that chose not to, or there that, that didn't really engage in the way that DOH said their municipal citizens should be engaged. So it, it's, you know, if you say it's not based off of what's happening on the ground, and I wanted to be clear about that, it's almost, it's almost, <clears throat> and it's not an academic exercise, but it's an exercise it's an to evaluate where you are to see where we can provide assistance. Not just to say, you have a C, it's what can we do to help you implement what you say you want to implement. Was it process based? Yes. So you're looking at the process to get this plan. Together. That's correct. Yes, <laughs> so that DOH is process. Where can I find this? The affordable housing scorecards. Yeah. You can find it on our website. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So Center for Housing yeah. uh, CHEO. And our actually our temporary website just went live, and I clicked through yesterday, and the it literally went live yesterday. We're in the process of building out a new one, but that affordable housing. Um, plan scorecard is you'll see it about the third of the way down. You'll see the narrative change playbook, you'll see the toolkit, and then you'll see that. I'm on it right now. Are you? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, and you can sign up and get on your distribution. Line. That's right. So, yeah. does, was the scorecard only for the, um, d does that include the River Cog towns other than Lyman Old Lyman? No. Okay. No, we, so CHEO's jur like, jurisdiction was originally 42 towns, which matches the 42 towns that. Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut serves in Eastern Connecticut. There are there were 10 towns left out in Tallinn County because they are served by the Hartford Community Foundation. And it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to us. So Community Foundation and Community Foundation spoke and said, you can like take that whole piece because it makes sense to keep it with, with the county. Again, the Community Foundation's geography doesn't match up with COGS, it doesn't match up with counties, it's just the towns that they serve. So there are 52 towns in those three counties. 22 towns are in New London County. So. Do you do anything on the legislative front, like trying to affect legislation? Is that part of your agenda as well? That is what our partner, the Partnership for Strong Communities, does a lot of. Okay, so they, you rely they, on one of the that partners. Actually, that. I re, the, he re, they rely on us to tell them, if they say, what's going on in Eastern Connecticut, I can give them Deb's name or Jim's name or Bob's name if they want to come up and testify. You know, I, I have more contact in the local community, but those voices need to be elevated by places like the partnership. It can't just be the lobbyist sitting up there saying, we need $8 million for additional voucher funds. It needs to be somebody actually impacted to, to move the needle. Okay. So, so, and, but yes, I do, I did submit testimony um, last week to the appropriations committee in support of additional um, rapid rehousing and voucher expansion. So, so it's your narrative there, your your, your narrative guide. Yes. Is on your website. Too. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I guess the, the third question was: you had your preserve. What is the preserve? You talked about production. You talked about narrative. What's the preservation and, pre and preservation and protection? So I'll, I'll be honest, it's a little bit trickier. Mm -hmm. uh, these are houses that are either deeded affordable or what people consider naturally affordable 
um, housing, naturally occurring affordable housing. So for instance, the larger three families or two families or, you know, one to four families are the bulk of our, our, of our affordable housing in the nation. And a lot of these one to four families are stressed because of lack of capital improvement and, and maintenance and making sure that, you know, that, that the, the trim isn't falling off and hitting someone. So working with existing programs such as entitlement towns like New London that has certain pockets of revolving loan funds, that's what we've been looking at, but we really need to replicate it on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, there are plenty of, you know, older homes that are rentals and that are naturally occurring, occurring affordable housing that have people that don't have the ability to maintain them. So either a revolving loan of funds to assist or like the new energy um, statutes that allow for landlords to put solar on so long as it benefits the tenants. You know, looking at things like that to increase the ability of that owner to maintain the property in good fashion. But it also means looking at things like possibly basement apartments, possibly attic apartment, you know, all of the things being equal. Where can you fit more housing in and do it in a way that's that that complies with town regulations and most particularly the building codes and, and public health and safety codes. Um, that becomes a little bit trickier. And that's part of what um, we there is a lot of question about how you can do some additional conversions in existing buildings. Like how is that done? Um, so putting together probably a toolkit and resources for doing that. Speaking of, let's, let's, <laughs> want to go to, the, to oh, the, yeah. the, the virtual segment of the of the meeting? Yeah, I see. Go ahead, Megan. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Beth, so much for for joining us. And I just wanted to tell. The committee first and foremost that on these coordination meetings that we've been having with CAGO I've been singing all of your praises um, <laughs> but I just wanted to point out um, from Beth's presentation um, the kind of overlaps and synergies between what CAGO does and what we're doing as the housing committee um, First of all, the data collection, that's going to be a huge resource for us. I know we at Rivercook are working on the data dashboard for us to use in our needs assessment and future planning, but we now have another resource for collecting and comparing data so we can make good use of that. It's going to be a lot of useful stuff that we will need. Um, in addition, with the needs assessment, you know, if Southeast COG is working on a housing needs assessment and we are working on a housing needs assessment, we can coordinate those efforts. I can bring back what we talk about in those meetings and report out in those meetings what we talk about here. So I think having um, some sort of coordination, a united front on that will be really useful, especially when we're talking about, you know, comparing to what the state might come out with or influencing how the state requires a housing needs assessment. Um, and then finally, toolkit's been mentioned a number of times. So I know I've mentioned to Beth about the toolkit that we've been working on. There might be opportunities there for us to kind of build some capacity or scale up what we're working on and, and use CHEO as a resource. Yeah. I, I think what you're doing for the housing, the, the menu of options is phenomenal. What I've seen so far, and I just, we would love to, you know, work with your team to make sure we can get all of the information that maybe you can't get to in your everyday, and then maybe scale up or design or get it out there so that people can actually look at what River Cog has done and, and maybe develop their own or borrow heavily from it rather than reinventing the wheel, but it's an awesome tool. I think it's an awesome tool. Anyone else from the from the Zoom call? Okay, no. Back to room here. David. So I was interested about what you said about Eastern Connecticut being anti government. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't be in all government, otherwise they wouldn't have zoning laws. That's like true. That, right? So it's, they're just anti... Hartford. Hartford government. Right. State government. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So it's, okay. on a smaller scale, it's the, it's the Washington, it's the, it's, 
North Dakota, uh, Iowa mentality, Texas mentality out in our eastern. It, it, it is, but I was on a panel discussion with <coughs> a, a, a chief elected official out of Fairfield County. Um, and I was told, look, Eastern, and literally this was what was said, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting considering we're literally, you know, my, a stone's throw apart to think that a couple of towns feed the entire state. You hear that enough and the, and this part of the state starts to think, I don't want to deal with people that think they feed me. We, you know, we, we're not being fed by Fairfield County. We're Eastern Connecticut. We've got, we've got our own strengths. And that was, that was my sense of it. So I, that was, it, it's repeated often. It is repeated often that Fairfield County drive or Hartford, either one drives what happens in the rest of the state. Well, they pass state laws that are, that's what they do in Hartford. They, everybody from all of the towns get to, gets to participate in that process. So yes. Kind of, um, I don't know. So in New London, you mentioned you had 22% affordable housing? 22.6%. Okay, 22 yeah. almost, almost 23. Oh, almost 27. So how did you achieve that and what, what do you define as affordable? Affordable housing is exactly what most of us went through that own homes. Uh, when we go to a mortgage, the mortgage broker says, you cannot spend more than 30% of your income on your housing costs. It's the same analysis for affordable housing. It's housing that's affordable. Deeded affordable housing is different. New London is 22.6% affordable housing as counted by DECD for the 830G list. Mm -hmm. So so that 830G is the statute that says if you don't have, right. 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 So DECD maintains the list of the deeded affordable units, which would include everything from, in this area, it might be USDA loans are deeded affordable, CHAFA, CHFA loans are deeded affordable, VA loans, Veterans Affairs loans are deeded affordable, um, government assisted projects, so vouchers that are attached to the tenants that, that provide assistance to say a complex. There are also complexes that receive government funding to be affordable. So DOH money or HUD money or CDBG money, and then there are state and federally owned housing projects. All of those exist in New London. So that's how they got there. New London is trying desperately to get that number down. And that's being done through the large creation of, of many units of market rate housing along downtown with the, with the increase of um, EB hiring. So you know downtown now on the corner of Bank and Howard Street which was a redevelopment parcel when I was on redevelopment agency for 20 some odd years. Now you, a studio is $1,900, a studio. Mm -hmm. Which, so they're, 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 you know, New London is, New London hears a lot from its citizens that they're being displaced. But at the same time, New London for a long time has seen a paucity of investment of market rate housing. So their numbers should equalize. Mm -hmm. The opposite issues. Opposite issues. That's right. They had too much. Thirty percent. I I always think of affordable housing as for people who generally can't afford housing, keep them off. You know, I mean the the the, the well, in lower the end of the scale. But you know, I, I mean, if you have all millionaires, thirty percent. Right. Is what I call affordable housing. Right. So was, when you say affordable housing, what's the benchmark? What, what are you looking for? Or what is 22.6% 22.6% mean for what's the what's the average? Um, or what's the benchmark for that 22.6%? Well, About two thirds of the median uh, uh, household income for the county. It would be the AMI. So they 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 if okay. you're at 20% of AMI, <laughs> you. you're very low income. If you're 50 right. to 20, yeah. you're low income, right? So yeah. it's on those bands. Right. So it's all on the MFA and the right. But so when you when you said something exactly right, I'll go back to my, my Fairfield example. 
I think I looked at the AMI down there. It was like $103,000 for a single person, right? And so if you say, well, 30% of that can go towards housing costs, that's a $30,000 a year rent, which by any measure doesn't appear to be affordable, right? So it starts to get out of whack when you do that kind of upper calculation. I will tell you that the housing needs assessment, I think we'll see it nationally, shows that it's low income, very low income that are in the most need and those at 80% or above AMI. So people that are looking to you know, transition, I'll use my parents as an example. They had a two story colonial house with an in-ground pool down by the beach in New London. They looked for seven years. I told my realtor friend, because I was a real estate lawyer, do me a favor, stop showing my parents' houses. They're just wasting your time. And it took them seven and a half years to find a ranch to move to that actually had a bathroom on the first floor. Um, you know, it's a, it's an, they could have moved at any point. It wasn't the appropriate housing for them to move to. It's a lack of housing options and opportunities that we're seeing kind of gum up the works. And it's on both ends. It's on the low income, very low income side, and then on the upper side of income bands. But 30%, that's the general, if you went to, if you have a constituent that's a mortgage broker, say, hey, you know, if I make a hundred grand a year, what can I afford in a mortgage? And he would back it out. No, I get that part. Yeah. It's just 30% in a vacuum doesn't mean anything. Correct. You need to look at income. Right. It has to be, has to be. But affordable housing, as I described, also includes homeowner products like the VA, CHFA, USDA, all of those loans are government subsidized loans. Right. People don't think of those as deeded affordable, but they are. They're considered deeded affordable in Connecticut because they're affordable mortgage products. Yeah. The, the land itself isn't deeded, but the mortgage has a recapture clause usually on the back about how much someone can, <laughs> can earn uh, when they sell their property. I have a question about the narrative change thing. Yes. We were just, uh, I was talking with Pat and, and Bonnie just before this meeting about um, what we needed on local commissions and committees for affordable housing. And, and what I told them was, at least from my experience in O'Lime, that I felt reasonably comfortable about the, the technical and the regulatory and even some of the financial aspects. And we do, not that we have it in hand, but we know where to start. And the, the thing that keeps me up at night that, that we have, what I have, a blind spot for is the narrative change, is the education, the community outreach parts of it. So the, this toolkit is, I know, is going to be a valuable resource. If um, if if we had someone on a local commission that maybe wasn't an expert in this area, wasn't a communications trained, experienced specialist, is there someone in your organization or one of the other, um, one of the seven partners where we could go for some help? Yes. Um, that's what we, so I just had this, this is just hot off the heels of a meeting with CCOG yesterday. Um, one of the pieces of the Connecticut Project grant is to hold convenings solely for commission members and staff to share ideas, to do peer learning across towns, because we don't tend to have many opportunities to do that, bring in speakers for best, you know, best practices, experts, our project manager, me, and the regional planner is also going to help with that. All of it is in furtherance of further training and education. Um, and in fact, that was the conversation I had with CCOG yesterday. They're doing the uh, fair housing training for planning and zoning commission members. And they said on the heels of that, maybe we want to do, maybe you, CHEO, want to do the narrative piece. Right, so they'll do the technical training, we'll take the narrative piece and talk to them about some of the, the language that they're gonna hear. And I sat in on a meeting where you were a member of the body and that was fairly tame, that meeting, but I know that elected officials get called also, and, and volunteers get called all sorts of things. And, and at, I mean, like really strange things. And I think commission members are, are not really well served by not having the training on how to deal with that. I don't think it's a, you ask your friend, I was, I was a chairperson of my political party in my town. I would ask my friends, my neighbors to run for office, and then I'd say, all right, see you later, right? Or call me if you need anything. And then they're being called, you know, 
all sorts of awful things by their neighbors down the road and they don't know you, you haven't equipped them to deal with that and and understand what to anticipate they're going to hear and what it means and i think we need to do more of that education mm -hmm. i do and i think it's helpful to share too and, and and say well you know i was an old lime and i heard you know how are you going to control her from not moving in 14 kids Right. Or something like that. And you need to unpack that statement for for what it is and recognize it for what it is. Well, how, do you, how do you convince somebody? I was going to ask you about that because I've heard that argument made in, in our uh, PMZ meeting. Mm -hmm. This could lead to more kids in town. Well, to me, that's sort of a shocker because, you know, having kids and, you know, supporting them is paying it forward because we were all kids and the, right. kids, the people who were objecting to kids were kids. So what is your answer to that? How do you approach that? You, well, you say, just, you don't know, just stare at them and say, you, you know, what I would do in a bad mood, but what would you say to them? Well, so there's data, but data can only go so far. Like if you start saying, Oh, you know, out of out of government, say Section 8 vouchers, 1.2 kids end up, I'm just making things up, in the public schools. And that's roughly what the data shows, 1.4 students, um, you know, per X number of bedrooms. That's really not, it's not, it's more to the question of what you were asking. What's a community without children? Right? It's, it's turning that conversation around. Ah, gee, I would love to have my grandchildren living near me. I would love to have them riding the bike in the backyard. What do you mean? Like, I, I would love to be able to get my, my nephew off the bus in the afternoon. I'm, you know, that kind of conversation. And, and most, I think, most grandparents would say, oh, yeah, you're right. I'd love to have little Johnny in the backyard or next door, or down the road, not, you know, an airplane away. So that's the kind of conversation. Turn it. It's yes. There, there. Yes, you're right. There could be more children. And guess what? That means there'll be more noise, more joy, more kids parading, more. Or you can use the example of Old Saybrook. Old Saybrook had 90 students graduate from its high school, and 60 students enroll in its kindergarten. You've lost. You know. You've. That's losing something for your community to lose those students out of your public school. That means there'll be fewer, you know, options for those students going to school. They'll be, they'll have to be. You may not have Chinese anymore or whatever it was that was important to you as a community because we have fewer students, therefore we have a contraction in staff. So yeah, recognize it. You're right. You're right. There could be more kids and that's great. I think it's great. They're saying it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> but if you talk about their grandchildren, if you talk about Brian who had to come for a week from Missouri or wherever he is, you only got to see Brian a week. Wouldn't it be nice if you could see him, you know, every other month if he were in Litchfield or every month or whatever it is. And hopefully their parents are now part of the community and they could be active volunteers on different board and commissions. <laughs> right. That would be the ideal. But <laughs> but I know, I mean, it's it's getting... It's getting harder and harder for people to, to, to volunteer, to be citizen commissioners. It's a, it's a hard job, I think. And I don't just say that commissioners for PNC, affordable housing, um, you know, it could be a board of selectmen. I was on the board of selectmen in Waterford. It could be anything. It could PTO, be anything. It yeah. could be your church. It, it could be whatever. You've got right. new blood in coming through your organization. That's so. right. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's funny what, what triggers people, but if you say, this is important to me, and and if if you know, like it's important to me that Brian can be close by my grandson, like back to the grandson. And you look at your friend, you're like, oh yeah, it's important to me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just kind of you've got to make it feel real because it is real. Because it, it we have Deborah. I mean, I'll I'll just say Deborah came up to me. I've had um, a series of conversations at Shiloh Church. It used to be called uh, Shiloh Family Life Center. It used to be called Shiloh Baptist Church. We've been having um, conversations with the faith community in New London, Groton, Norwich. They've been coming to Shiloh. Uh, Deborah came up to me afterwards and she said, Beth, I worked at l &M Hospital, now it's Yale, in New London for 50 years in patient transport. She said, and I retired, I'm set, she said, I'm 75, I retired at 70. Last, two years ago, my rent was $1,100. She said, that was okay. Last year, it was $1,500. I had to get into my 401k 
She said, March 1st, they wanted to be $1,800. She said, Beth, I'm 75. I'm going to have to go back to work. She's on an affordable housing, senior housing list in Groton. It's 18 months long. So she is either going to have to go back to work, double up, find, you know, find, find some way to make it. And this is somebody that worked for 50 years. There, uh, to me, there's something, I mean, I don't, this is part of what CHEO does that like Megan and Sam can't do and planners can't do. I think that's immoral. And I think we need to tell people it's immoral that we have 88 year olds in New London housing, um, homeless hospitality center with their walkers. I think it's immoral. And I think it's a call to action when you see that. So, Absolutely. so that kind of agitation and advocate, that's the kind of local advocacy that I would do. Deborah, where have you been all my life? That is that is a beautiful thing that you just said. <laughs> I see Carla has a um, her hand up online. Yeah, I was just going to say, Beth, I love that that's sort of the approach that you've been taking because I think that that really does speak to people. And and the one other thing I just mentioned for folks that are sort of curious about that particular question on kids in the school system is that. Um, exactly to your point, Beth, about Old Saybrook, when you have that declining school population, that's actually where you start to see the costs really go up with the educational cost share for capital improvements to schools. Because whether you have one kid in the school or a thousand, you still need to maintain the building standards. And Essex in particular <laughs> is dealing with this right now at Region 4. Um, there's a lot going on with that. And so I think that's another thing for the folks who may be more financially minded, maybe they don't have any grandkids, maybe they're not interested in seeing more joy and more kids in their community, but they're concerned about their taxes. That's another thing you can mention is that this region in Eastern Connecticut, those are very real concerns because those buildings, a lot of them are old. And mm -hmm. if they've only got a handful of students in them, it's going to cost a lot more per, <clears throat> per household in town to fix them up. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'm hearing a lot of wonderful things coming out of CHEO. How do we get one of those here? <laughs> how, do, how do we get a center? In in here? In, uh, in or, Middlesex? Uh, in, uh, yes. But yeah, also, say Middlesex so we adjoin. Also the everywhere. Like, how, you know, how do we get those pieces that your center provides into the other parts of the state that don't currently have it? Well, that's what, that's what we're going to, that's what we're trying to do through the CHO. So, for instance, tomorrow there's a new um, segregation and housing report that came out in January. Fairfield Center for Housing Opportunity is having a conversation about that report to unpack it so that planners and teams can come in. It's a webinar and listen and see what what you know the data is showing about is, is segregation and housing alleviating, is it abating somewhat in Connecticut? The answer is sort of, not really, um, not enough, uh, but that conversation, that kind of peer learning is something that the centers are doing. I will say like New Haven has a very well developed housing culture, whether it's the tenant union for because it's the site of the, the Connecticut's tenants union, they have, have had fair rent commission, they've had Elm City, they've had all sorts of different organizations. So New Haven wouldn't be an area that a CHO would necessarily look at because it's got such a well developed ecosystem. Whereas someplace like Naugatuck or Waterbury doesn't have necessarily that kind of team of professionals or advocates, whether they're finance or planners or elected officials, it's not as robust. So that's what we're trying to do in Eastern Connecticut is develop that robust. Yes. And yeah, we'll come to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good. What's the racial demographic in Eastern Connecticut? I'm sorry? What's the racial demographic in Eastern Connecticut? Oh, you know, I don't know. Is that a fair fair answer? Uh, sure. Right. Yeah, I don't know. But, it goes you know, town by town. Second, but as a state, we're the second most segregated state in the country after what? Mississippi or Alabama. That's right. true. And that's largely because of housing right. policies. Right. So right. how do you break that one? Well, that's, that's, to me, that's <laughs> the ultimate question in the United States, in your state, in your, in your, in your county, in your town, is, is racism. That, that is our cancer. Yeah. It has been since the day we were established. It remains that way. It almost killed us 
175 years ago didn't quite, it's coming back, mm -hmm. and how do you break that? The, the, the quick and rough and ready answer is to say it's got to be a statewide solution. Because if you leave it to home rule and the communities, right. this is what you get. Okay. Um, the center's position is, quite frankly, all of that is true, and our work is focused on the people that actually want to do the work. So all of that is true, and the advocates up in Hartford, I, you know, I, I know this is a this is something I talk to shoreline communities about. Transit-oriented development is a different thing in Old Saybrook, right, than it is in Old Line, right? Isn't that a fair statement? And they're and they're literally a river apart. So you've got to tailor, you've got to recognize that it is different in Old Line than it is in Old Saybrook, but you've got to say, you're different and you're special Old Line, but you've really got to do something around this. And what that looks like, you have to be at the table to define or somebody's going to do that for you. That, that Hartford thing. Um, I think people don't believe that, and that's why we haven't seen a lot of excited movement. I think if they saw something that looked like that might break through the legislative impasse, they, you might see more towns stepping up. See, we're going to be working with towns and cogs that want to work with us in the hopes that we have success stories so that other towns want to work with us. And we're not mandating that towns work with us. Right? We're not coming in and say, hi, we know better than you. We're here to solve everything because that's not what we're doing. We're, we want to look at your plans. If you wanted every single plan in New London County says we want to do more um, first time home buyer education, but not a single town has done anything about it. So we'll take that piece and, and go out to the towns and say either it's your employees or it's your residents or it's both, but let's do something. And we'll take that lift because one thing I know from 20 years of elected office is towns are doing far more with far fewer people to do the jobs. And it's a huge strain on those municipalities. So recognize it and say, all right, we're not asking you to do more. Tell us what you want to do. We'll give you samples and you decide. But we are going to call you 15 times until you decide. So that's <laughs> right. So with that, we're, you got five minutes. Five minutes, until you're yeah. At 3 I just want to know funding. So we're going to. Funding? That has a hard stop at three and okay. needs to get connected to a call. So when you need, is it time for you to? Um, I have about, I'll take, I'll, I'll answer funding. Okay. Yeah. So um, right now I'm in the <clears throat> process of soliciting additional funding, but our primary funders are this year, are the Connecticut Project, clearly, because that's a, a large um, infusion. The Community Foundation, Centerville Bank, um, I'm going to leave somebody out, Chelsea Groton Bank, Dime Bank. Berkshire Bank, um, United Way, all of the partners contribute, our uh, RPA, um, the partnership all contribute to the center. And I'm I'm charged with raising the balance where we have gaps. And helping towns uh, generate funds for production. I mean, you have, uh -huh. the, so this is supporting the, your good, great, amazing work. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting dollars into the communities to assist with the actual production right right so so i'm just going to use your example as towns mm -hmm. just towns are sitting a lot of land and they may not be in as partners with equity and but they could be in with their their engineers working and they could give the land and then you know the developer bar we may we're looking at trying to raise a pool of pre-development dollars for smaller organizations that say need to do a survey or a perk test or do you know a rough site plan to at least get the door open mm -hmm. we're looking at establishing a revolving loan fund for those kind of small projects mm -hmm. um, that's one piece of it and we also have LISC which is uh, um, coming in as a funding partner and um, organization that will connect with developers and Kind of, they do pre-development money. It just tends to be a little expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's like six percent plus attorneys' fees, and you know, maybe something smaller, and they can take the bigger piece. You're welcome. Good. Well, with that.
That's all, all on behalf of the thank committee. You. I will thank you very much. Thank I, you, I, it never fails to be an energizing and inspirational experience <laughs> to be around you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for letting me use uh, the conference room yeah. for the preservation meeting. I appreciate it. And please sign up for our emails. And if you see, um, if you see anything come up, you know, despite the fact that you may be in Westbrook, gee, my aunt lives in Westbrook, my son lives in Westbrook, you know, come to New London, come to Norwich, come up to Willimantic for these convenings, because it's an opportunity to hopefully spread the word, even in communities that don't have a CHO. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'll, I'll email you about coffee. It. It's Ashland Farms, right? Yes. Uh, we'll that's coffee. Yes. The best. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yes, I want to back up. Yes. Okay. All the way back. Yeah, thanks, Becca. Okay. Similar experience to uh, last month when we had Kara. We could have gone on all afternoon and probably into, into the evening with us. So, um, but I think we got some good, good points of connection. And um, clearly, I. I Look forward to hearing the results and seeing more of the results of the collaboration that River River Cog has going on. Mm. Um, the data with them. Mm. With them. So, uh, next up on the agenda, legislative update. Who's going to do that? Um, Sam, are you doing that, or do you mm. want me to? I I can do it. Uh, no, I I know we're going over, so I'll do this very quickly. Um, but there's a number of bills that we're tracking um, uh, that are working their way through the General Assembly. Uh, some have already had hearings, but all of them you can submit testimony on. Um, it's not too late. Um, and I'll quickly go over some bills of interest. Um, first, the housing affordable uh, affordable housing bills that we're following is uh, House Bill 5158. Um, that's an act concerning the standardized valuation of affordable rental housing. And I'll send this to you. You don't have to write it all down. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Do You're all scrambling to write it down. Eliza Hurl, the pen's clicking. <laughs> uh, and and, and we, we'll, we'll include hyperlinks to the bill info pages. So this is a bill that uh, would allow um, uh, affordable rental housing developments to be valued based on the rent as opposed to the highest best use of that property. Very similar to how commercial, like re, uh, commercial office space is um, valued based on the, the lease values. So um, so that way, if um, if a landlord is renting at affordable rents, they'd get a break on their uh, tax assessment. Um, uh, the, uh, let me go back uh, to the bills. Uh, the next bill is House Bill 5157. And this is concerning property tax abatement for certain first time home buyers. Um, so under this, if you get a Chaffa mortgage, uh, you could get up uh, up to a five hundred dollar tax abatement off your property tax. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's a big thing. Um, Senate Bill two hundred seven, an act concerning housing authority jurisdiction. I think this is a bill that's very interesting and has a lot of potential. It it would allow a housing authority in one municipality to to operate in other municipalities. I think one of the flaws here, though, is that there's no invitation. It doesn't, uh, it can just go to any municipality it wants to grow into. Um, I think a better approach would be a partnership with uh, with additional towns. And that way, um, if there was a, a, if there was a housing authority doing good work in one city or town, it, uh, a neighboring town could invite it in to either operate its housing or to do a new project. Um, I think without, uh, without having an agreement process or an invitation, I, I think you have potential creating conflict, but I do think um, the idea of every city and town having its own housing authority is, is, is and probably not the best way of doing things. Um, so, I, so I so I do support the concept, although I think the mechanics there needs to be an invitation and agreement process. And the and the last bill of house uh, housing slash affordable housing, which I think of, of interest, is uh, a House Bill fifty one seventy. This is an act concerning temporary shelter units for persons experiencing homelessness located on real property owned by religious organizations. This is in response to um, a church in New Haven that has directed these, uh, these trailer units um, to provide housing for homeless people. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, it, it's akin to allowing 
um, the, the construction of uh, really a, a small campground. Uh, and it's it's meant to address the issue of people living outside in tents. Um, uh, I, I think there's I think there could be some improvements to the bill, but uh, but this is uh, I think uh, an, an approach to allow um, to allow religious organizations who want who want to be able to actively um, help address this issue to address that issue. I think the bill is interesting. Um, I, I do think it could use some improvements, but. Um, but you're also dealing with a, a, a real a real tragedy in a lot of places where you do have people living outside in the winter. Um, next, under funding, you have House Bill 5178, uh, an act concerning funding for the development of affordable housing. Um, uh, this is, uh, the, these. there's actually three, uh, um, uh, there's actually multiple fund housing funding bills, um, and I'll just read out their numbers. Um, uh, there's uh, House Bill 5115, an act authorizing bonds of, state, uh, of the state for grants to aid certain nonprofit organizations for the development of affordable housing. House Bill 5122, an act authorizing bonds of the state to fund the, the small multifamily lending program. Um, and then there's two others, uh, Senate Bill uh, 142 and Senate Bill um, 6. And, and the first one is um, uh, has an act establishing a housing authority resident quality of life improvement grant program and a housing choice voucher task force, and then uh, a act concerning housing. This is coming from the Housing uh, Commission. Um, I applaud uh, all these approaches to the help buy down the cost of housing. Um, so I think those are all good things. And then the last category of, um, of bills are the TOD bills. Um, and I think the one of very of a great interest to us is, um, is uh, House Bill 5006. An act concerning restoring funding to Sterling East Rail. Um, Sterling East uh, commuter rail service has been slashed forty to forty four percent of its pre COVID service level, uh, and I, I, it's I think important uh, as their discussion about TOD is that you can't have TOD without transit, and you need to have a certain minimum level of tra of, of transportation for to <laughs> for to be viable, and the less transportation you have. Um, the less options you have to get to work or to get home, that round trip either becomes difficult or impossible. So, um, so I think that's a, I, I think restoring funding and service to Shawnee East is is very important. Um, there's also House Bill 5278, an act concerning TOD. This um, uh, um, prioritizes uh, transit-oriented development type development for state discretionary funds and also allows there to be more pl state planning money to be able to do um, plans for transit-oriented development. And last but not least is Desegregate Connecticut's uh, forthcoming Live, Work, Ride bill. Um, this uh, this is a TOD bill um, that would uh, um, increase density in, in town centers um, and near stations where you have mass transit or town centers where you don't have mass transit, but you have a bus route that 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 runs five days a week. Um, I, uh, this is very similar to a proposal proposed last year. Um, my cr critique of it is that uh, I wish it was a, a little bit more focused on the the transit side of TOD. In that um, you need you, you need you need a, you need a level of service to be to make a, a ride via transit viable. And unfortunately, the the, the threshold. Is this is there a bus um, five times a week? Well, so, some of our buses in our region they run once every two hours. There are some routes that run only twice a day, um, and so I think there needs to be at least some um, some at least focus on the places that are, that have most opportunity to be transit oriented, uh, such as our train stations, our bus passenger terminal in downtown Middletown, and try to and try to focus on real successes in those places first. Um, but, um, but, uh, but that, the, but the final bill has not been released. So we don't know what it's going to look like, uh, when, when it is introduced. So, so that's, that's my summary of, um, Bill's so far. Sam, um, excuse yeah. me, I have a question. Sam, uh, David Long here. Uh, have you heard anything about, uh, uh, fair share housing? No. Oh, uh, so fair share housing for everyone who is not, not familiar is the Open Communities Alliance the last couple of years have has proposed a bill that would calculate um, 
which would sort of require um, most municipalities in Connecticut to take on a share of low um, of lower income households in the state. Um, the, the calculation was that there was about 140,000 households in Connecticut that are struggling with housing costs. And the solution identified was that for each one of these um, households that are struggling to, uh, to, um, to pay for housing costs would be to build them a new housing unit in a rural or suburban municipality. Um, um, I've been critical of this approach the last couple of years, more or less because it, it, it really didn't give any agency to the people that it seeks to help. There, there was no consultation to uh, to uh, to any of these households and find out what their what their desires are and their needs. It says that if you live in let's say the city of Waterbury, that that really the only solution for uh, for you is to leave. Um, and I think that conflicts with a number of our adopted state policies for um, uh, regarding smart growth and also um, trying to minimize sprawl and um, in and protect our natural environment. Um, of course, at the same time, um, every municipality needs some amount of affordable housing. Every municipality has uh, uh, essential, low, uh, unfortunately, low-paid service workers that are needed in their towns, even the smallest towns. Um, so there's a need uh, for affordable housing everywhere. Um, but but I but I think the but I, I I took the proposal and the name to be somewhat pejorative. So um, um, at the end of the last session. Uh, there was a bill did pass that directed uh, there to be a, a fair share methodology created, uh, and that to be adopted by the General Assembly. I have heard nothing about that, and from what I've heard inside the State Department of Housing, which is a relatively new State Department because it was a, previously a part of the UCD, that they're not, they're not crazy about the, the the bill that was passed. So, um, so, so the answer to your question, David, no. Um, I have not heard of a new bill, and I have not heard any update as to that methodology. Um, um, I, I, I think I, I think having some sort of methodology that takes into consideration let's say uh, employment in your town, uh, I think would would be a, would be a good start. Um, and and I think that would naturally sort out that you would um, you would have affordable housing closer to where. Uh, you have jobs that um, that are lower paid, such as um, service jobs in many sectors, um, and and then in places that are more uh, more rural, you you would have a much lower a threshold. I think if that's if you were to create goals, I think that would be a much better way of doing it. But uh, but but that's not uh, but that is not in, uh, part of the consideration, at least in my understanding of the fair share methodology. So, Sam has the. Uh... If I recall correctly, there was going to be an administrator hired to be at the center of this. Was was that hire made? Do you know? That's a good question. So, um, so the Office of Policy and Management, who's responsible for state planning, they're responsible for the state plan and conservation development. They have hired new staff, and they've actually hired some uh, AICP uh, uh, Academy uh, American Institute of Certified Planner uh, certified planners. Um, I would assume that um, that the woman responsible would be Rebecca Auger um, at OPM, but I I don't think anyone is thrilled over at OPM for this because I think I think the bills that have come out that have identified OPM doing a lot of this work um, I, I think greatly oversubscribe or uh, uh, cause the hours of these people to be greatly oversubscribed. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we have good staff at OPM. Um, I don't think they've nearly enough to be able to take on some of the roles that are being asked of them. Uh, like for, and I'll give you an example. The, the, the draft desegregated Connecticut uh, Live Work Ride Bill um, puts a lot of uh, determination on the shoulders of a person at OPM. And, uh, and I don't uh, because a lot of the terms are not are not defined. There's things like called reasonable, and that we and what's reasonable and what isn't reasonable is, uh, is determined by this uh, individual at OPM. I think that I think that 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 the staff at OPM that they've hired I think is a great step forward. I just don't think there's there's enough to be able to handle some of that. But but it's to to be seen. Um. 
also talking about legislation, Megan needed to leave, so she asked me to let you all know that she has written up a summary of the Work Live Ride bill uh, that I will be forwarding to you all. And um, we already know that Desegregate is bringing their bill text to Old Saybrook and East Haddam, so uh, to their planning and zoning committees. So if you haven't heard from them, you may be shortly. Wait, who would live? Who's bringing it? Desegregate. Desegregate. Um, and all the bills Sam talked about, we have in a spreadsheet that I will send to you. Um, and if anyone here wants like a short uh, Zoom session or phone call with me about how to track bills or how to submit testimony, I'd be happy to, to do that. Just let me know off this to the side. Other questions, comments? So thanks, Sam and Eliza. That's, that's a lot of work and it, it it really saves us a lot of work to have to know that you guys are, are on this. So, you know, now have 17 towns that are benefiting from 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 your guys' uh, efforts are very much appreciated. Okay, then uh, next up uh, at our last meeting, uh, Marcos uh, presented an idea and some some pre work that had been done to engage Habitat for Humanity and the Hope Partnership on. Uh, essentially mapping out opportunities that is that a fair characterization Marcos it is and yes. and uh, we agreed back then that Marcos is going to come back at this meeting and say a little bit more about it and, and take some feedback and maybe gauge some interest from, on the part of the sure. of our members okay um, I will keep it short so everybody uh, do you have this handout potentially there's more at the end of the table there we go and this will also get sent out um, digitally as well, as well the PowerPoint. Um, okay. You can control. Oh, thank you. Wow. All right, so real quick, recap what, why we're here. Uh, kind of look at the parameters put forth by Habitat, Hope, and Mercy. Kind of look at next steps and we'll take questions. So uh, the last couple of uh, meetings, we came together and we had guest speakers kind of discuss their uh, ideal projects or what they're working on in our region. And so as a follow-up, we wanted to reach out and kind of get really get into the weeds around those uh, parameters. And with that feedback, we created this handout here. And so this has the more detail. The PowerPoint is like the summary, the, the media version. And so um, with these discussions, we met individually with Habitat, with uh, Hope and for, with Mercy. And we wanted to better understand what they're looking for in an ideal um, site. So... Um, that's the next thing that we can offer kind of like kind of just want to reaffirm that we've done this engagement with these three organizations and I think the next step that we could do is like I said do the mapping exercise and what we get out of that are probably two scenarios one would be you know we find in a, a promising site that matches the criteria of one of these three um, organizations and then we connect the dots there and, and take it from there or the next step the, the next scenario is that we find nothing and at which case we would maybe recommend looking and seeing and brainstorming why that is and if there's something we want to do about it. So um, both scenarios I think are pretty valuable. And so the next step, if it's okay with the housing committee, is um, to kind of work off of the list of parameters that both the, the all three of the organizations put together and kind of do the analysis for most of the region. I think that's probably agnostic. There's some exceptions like Habitat doesn't really work in um, Clinton or Killingworth, so uh, we would we would exclude them from that analysis. But we'd probably do something regional. We're still working on that. And then my final note is that if you know of a potential site based off of the parameters in this document, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Or the point of contacts for each of the three organizations are on the pages. So if you want to reach out to them directly, go ahead and do that. So um, with that. Okay, so Habitat for Humanity. The way I kind of thought about this was uh, smaller to larger. So Habitat's footprint is primarily uh, single family detached homes, less than 1,400 square feet, two to three bedroom, or two be three bedroom, two baths is preferred layout. Um, they're an ownership mo model, so they're looking to get people into the homes that the person wouldn't own. Um, there's some site constraints that they 
brought up, so please no historic buildings or other restrictions. They would prefer no flood zones, but we can talk a little bit about that. Um, they would prefer no topography. They would prefer to be close to city water and sewer, but they can deal with well and septic system. Gas line would be a plus. And I think the biggest takeaway from Habitat is that they would like they would rather rehabilitate an existing building than build something new. But they can build something new. So um, let's see. I thought the other interesting item that they had was considered tax foreclosure opportunities when working uh, with the municipality. Um, They'd also be willing to work with the property owner that's interested in subdividing the property. And I think for talking about the narrative, they're, they're very keen on making sure that the habitat house matches the architecture and style of the neighborhood that it's in, so it doesn't get uh, singled out as like the habitat house. It's, it's meant to blend in. Uh, okay, so move on to the next one, Hope Partnership. So again, this is kind of, uh, if Habitat is smaller, Mercy is larger, Hope is somewhere in the middle. So they're, uh, they're into making rental properties, so they're both a property developer and a property manager. The project they're looking for in the region is 15 units, and those would be two to three bedroom units, 500 square feet and above. So um, they can build new. They also would like to do uh, adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Uh, and then some site constraints also, close to existing utilities, they'd like to be close to downtown so people can have uh, walking access to local amenities. They prefer to stay away from brownfields, no flood zones. Um, they would be willing to combine parcels to make a larger site to fit a bigger building footprint. Um, they could do a mixed use development, but we'd have to really talk about that, that would be difficult. But that was something that we kind of discussed during our interview. And then Mercy is more, of the three, they're, they're larger in the sense that the projects that they put together are larger. So they're also making <coughs> rental apartments. Uh, they're both a property, manager, a property developer and a property manager. And they're looking for a project size minimum 30 units. They're looking for a diversity of unit sizes. So 500 to 1,000 square feet, one bedroom studios all the way up to three bedroom units. Um, they are really big on being close to downtowns, being within uh, walking distance of like uh, village center amenities. And the idea there is to give the residents the opportunity to kind of age in place. And that kind of feeds in with the diversity of housing types, the different size apartments. Um, nothing historical, no wetlands, close to existing utilities. They can remediate a new building. They can build new, or they can remediate an old one, an old building. The idea is that if it's an old building, hopefully the site that they're looking for would be big enough that they could build on to the existing building to make it match the, the footprint that they're looking for. Um, one of the standouts for here is that they also like to create other public uses with their development. So, reflection spaces, playgrounds, community spaces, public gardens. Um, as far as matching the local character, they would consider like a several building development versus one large apartment building, but it really depends on the per unit cost. So, okay, so based off of those criteria, and there's more detail in the handout, more specifics. I just kind of did uh, top level, but we're going to run a GIS analysis based on the parcels for the region uh, with a few exceptions. We're going to try to not waste any time. So, like I said, Habitat, they don't operate in Clinton, so we wouldn't do an analysis for Habitat in Clinton. Uh, we've run the analysis for the criteria, see if there's a match, and then bring the results to you. That's the proposal. That's it. Would this be, um, you may not be familiar with this, but as part of Old Lyme's uh, 830J plan, we worked with um, 
SLC, S, what was the consultant? SLR. SLR consultants. And Kevin, you were involved in this, I think, to do a capacity analysis of in old line that sounds really similar mm -hmm. in that it was GIS based, mm -hmm. looking at the wetlands, looking at the flood zones, looking at stuff that was already developed, and just trying to get some sense. Uh, looking at environmentally constrained areas right. and, yeah. and there were a couple of levels of constraint just to try and I don't want to get too deep in this but if you look at the if you just look at, at the GIS of old Lyme and the, the stuff that's residential zoned and you look where the houses are you would think oh my god there's plenty of space there but you start to overlay these constraints and it it all went away and that was before you actually go to the apparently open space where the the apparently developable space and look at, at topography. <laughs> is it vertical? Is it is it a rock pile? Um, so, and that was really useful for us. Mm -hmm. So if it's if it's sim, Kevin, you were you yeah, have a bridge it's here. Fairly it, fairly similar. It's similar to that. that, and then overlaying some of these these additional criteria. Right. I, I don't know if in that one particularly if we looked at. Infill doing remediation of existing structures. No, it was, I think it was we were mainly looking for vacant land. Yeah, we looked. So start, this, start, the first cut was vacant. Was vacant, yeah. right? And then, <clears throat> like to, to your point, we we did run into issues where it's like it says it's vacant, but it's not. It's not really vacant. Or, oh, you had a question. Uh, along along your plot lines here, as things go away, <laughs> right? And a lot of municipalities you have your aquifer protection zones, and it really narrows down the available land mm -hmm. that you can build on. Right. You so know, that's, which, that's where things disappear in a vast right. amount of and land. Utilities is a big one, especially along the shoreline. Utilities aren't everywhere. Um, yeah. And that wasn't that wasn't in it. Right. Access wasn't in it. So that there's so there's a lot of it. factors. Right. But this, but this it, we it, haven't done it for every town, so yeah. it's it's a way of expanding that. But just to, to have a preliminary run at that, <laughs> it was hugely useful because it took this a really big problem and it cut it down to us having to look at it highlighted areas to look mm -hmm. at what the next level of problem was going to be to develop it, whether that's access or utilities or or, or topography. Another issue I want, I want to bring up because obviously I'm learning a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of towns now have these sustain sustainability plans and certifications in terms of land development. Have you folks looked at any of that in relation to available space for public housing? But, but we, I don't think we have really, well, yeah. Like the plans of conservation development, they, they kind of outline that. I mean, right. each one's unique, and a lot of the times they say, you know, we want to include uh, additional areas for um, housing or affordable housing. But that would be kind of part for this mapping exercise. All we're kind of doing is going through the list of like what the feedback was from the organizations and kind of doing a GIS parcel analysis, and then I mean, we would sanity check that when we brought that to the to the committee so so, so i'll stop talking about and, and let other people comment and question but i'll just say that based on the experience in the a30j plan we found that type of exercise to be really useful and saving us a lot of time okay that's, that's the goal is to make it useful so questions I oh. On the, no any, anybody on the line okay Marco, so now that you've thought about it more, I think I asked this last time, what would you need from a town that wanted to, to drill into this? If you wanted to, you need any data from the towns to support this? To submit a property, that type of thing? If you, is that what you're asking? Or, or at, at a, yeah. either a single property scale or a town-wide scale to just mm -hmm. help develop the map. And, I'm going to have to defer to Kevin, as yeah. I don't know what, what level we didn't of have, do we, we have. didn't have to give you a lot to No, no yeah, yeah, most of it I will have. Um, if, if there is, for whatever reason, something that, that the town has that I don't, or that the state doesn't have on offer of these criteria that we're looking for, because some of these are actually fairly specific mm -hmm. um, compared to what we've done in the past. Um, but no, it, it, if the, but what Marcos had mentioned, uh, if you look at this list and like something jumps off the page at you like we've been looking at this property already in town or 
maybe from from like the the perspective of if it's already town owned land and it's something that's of it like if you know a specific one that we're not just kind of trying to blanket the map that would be great to just throw it our way and then we can make sure that it it, it meets the criteria for one based on the data we have um, but then also makes it a more because no matter what we do what, what, what the what the analysis ends up drilling down to is blotches on the map and then you kind of go into those areas and and if Megan were still here she would tell you that we, we spent a long time going parcel by parcel once you get down to that smallest subset and then you really you, you still have to do some sort of ground truthing to make sure that it's not actually in a wetland or that there's ledge or, or whatever the, the the limiting factor right. might be. Right. So. Would you get access to the land use departments in so. the towns? I, you were working with Dan on that, right? Yeah, yeah. No, Dan, I, you, I, were, I, you were you know alignment. Yeah, I have I've got contacts for most of the towns to reach out if 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 I'm missing a piece. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So what do you need from us? Patience. Patience, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bigger project. It's three organizations, and then once we do like the mechanical process of like excluding wetlands and proximity to transit stations, then it's more of a qualitative, and that's kind of the sanity check where it's like, right. does yeah. is Habitat interested in starting a project there? I don't know. Yeah. So, so we'd probably come to you guys with with like the first cut, right? And then start drilling it down even farther from there but then then it's not just me looking from on high at the map from the data it's actually using your on the ground knowledge to make it so that the analysis we came up with actually makes sense, makes sense. Yeah. irrespective of ownership is this you know any any parcel that fits this even though it might be privately held or what do we own or what are you doing I, about that issue i was i would encourage to do the private ownership because um Let's use Habit for instance. Like, if they're interested in a certain parcel or a certain house, and the property owner, like, there's a scenario there where, like, a mm -hmm. property owner might want to sell it to Habitat. I'm not sure. I think having you having information that certain parcels meet certain criteria is valuable, right. whether or not they're public or private. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, the next cut, the sanity check would be whether or not we want to, what you want to work, what you'd like to do with that information. So, right. Yeah. None, none. This, at least at this stage. None of this is like we're going to take it and then post it online. No. Because that's, that's the last thing you want to do is say, oh, yeah, this house is perfect, but somebody already lives in it. <laughs> um, right. No. No. So th this is purely for the, for the sake of the exercise to kind of get the, the thoughts flowing of, okay, maybe we should focus here. Because right now we don't have a focus. Do you screen for protective status in the land, like it's in a conservation yes. easements, that sort of thing? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Any right. any of the land trusts or any of that? Yeah. So it's we're not we're not taking any of that into consideration. Yes. Farmland, I think we had used in the past, though. That's that's kind of a touchy subject, one way or the other. Um, I feel like if it's one of those unique curveball questions then we come back and then, talk about it and right. see what the appetite is for that but right now I think like very the simple things like wetlands proximity mm -hmm. uh, topography the, the make or break those questions. things those are like the red lines then I would say like I, I feel coming to you with that knowledge and then we can take it the next step but and this efforts greatly appreciated we, we simply just don't have the cycles in deep river we want this. We, we, you know, we brought back the talks from um, this meeting and some other resources. And it's like, well, how do we put that together? So I, this is greatly appreciated. Thank you for putting that together. Do you plan to pilot this on a few towns or, or limited basis, or are you going to kind of go across all 17 and well, uh, well, I think we're still one, trying to figure that out because it's yeah, like a, each one of them project. was fairly specific <clears throat> on their range of where they would be True. interested in working. So it's it's not a full region analysis for all three. Um, they've kind of got their little spheres where they're they're more interested in developing. The, they were a little open to expansion, but again, they're they're smaller. Some well, not all of them. But at least the smaller ones, they, they don't have the range to maintain properties outside of a certain area. So and that's that's kind of captured in those nuances are captured in this document. Mm -hmm. 
The two communities you mentioned that don't do habitat, I'm just curious, why is that? That was one of my questions I meant to follow up with her. They habitat. fall under a different habitat. Okay. They're, yeah. they're with the New Haven habitat. They're with a different okay. region. Yeah. Okay. Middlesex also doesn't work in Limerola because we're Eastern Canada. Okay. Right. But that would Same be easier. So. Okay. so one one thought that came to mind is um, I'm inferring that this is this is all based on public data. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I would be sensitive to the uh, the private property aspect of it and, and the way it was published. If people see their names out there, even oh. though anybody can go yeah. to GIS and and see it, I don't think there's general awareness of the level of detail of <laughs> of property ownership data that is that is public and that is accessible by the internet. So, um, probably don't want this to be the way that people learn that. Right. I agree. I'm definitely sensitive to that as well. Yeah. Yep. I think also we're sensitive to the fact that going on that, I'd like we want this to be successful and we want it to be helpful for you. So, um, yeah, if that is um, goes into the public in the wrong way or it gets off on the wrong foot, then that won't be helpful. So and, there's, there's a communications aspect to that. Correct. It's not just the technical that I think you just want to be aware of. Right. And I think. And I said this at the last meeting, but the communication is like here in the office, we're going to work on it. We're not publicizing it. And any kind of the results that we get, we're going to share with the committee. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Look forward to seeing it. All right. All right. We're a little behind, but next up is updates from members. Just a quick update. Um, I've been searching around and, and doing some research, and I found an article called Zoning by a Thousand Cuts. I sent it to Eliza by email, and I'm thinking that you might want to put it on our website for the members. Um, it's written by Sarah Bronin, who's also the, uh, the created uh, Desegregate America. You may know. It is a law review article, but don't let that deter you because it is written in plain English and it, it uh, collects data from Connecticut. Uh, so I thought it was very helpful. It gives a history of, the, um, of segregation in Connecticut and how zoning laws uh, assisted in making this one of the most segregated states in, in the country. And, um, and her proposed uh, tentative solution, I would call it, which is uh, do something about single family housing, because that is a big barrier to, that appears to be a big barrier to, uh, to, to uh, making housing both affordable and integrated. Thanks. It's called Zoning by a Thousand Cuts. So we'll send that out. And thank you, David. I, you actually saved us an agenda item here. I was going to bring this up oh, under other, other yeah, because I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. oh, no, that's okay. It's, I'm, I'm glad you did yeah. because it came from you. Yeah. Um, I understand you, you'd also recommended that we um, potentially have Sarah as a mm, as a guest speaker. Yeah, I, I think so because you know she's uh, uh, she's local. Right? You know, uh, well, she's local. She she lived in Hartford until she moved down. To Washington because she has a job at the feds. Yeah, she's she's heading a federal agency now, so right. we can reach out. I would I would uh, I guess I'd moderate expectations about her availability and timeline, but it but you, 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 she family up here. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. You can always I mean, ask. I, you know, her, her husband lives up here still in Hartford. In Hartford, yeah. You know, mayor of Hartford, yeah, former mayor of Hartford. Um, I was teaching, I think, at Yale uh, at the York Law School, and. Um, uh, yeah, so the local connection is there, and, and no harm in asking. Right. We uh, are Connecticut, and we are concerned about this issue. So she might give us ten minutes, you know, ten minutes at a time. And at least as a start, we'll uh, we'll put a link up, distribute the link to the to the uh, that law review or the Pepperdine yeah. law review article. And again, article. don't be intimidated because I know you know you hear a law review article and you think, oh, no. but it's written in plain English, no Latin phrases. So it's really long. It is long. Yeah. Yeah. It is a little, I mean, but you know, I, I, you know, so is Moby Dick. <laughs> so we'll follow up on that. 
Any other updates? Pat? Just no, I don't have an update this month. Um, just a question: Where? What's the status of the uh, grant that you guys? You have never. We have heard? no status. No. Um, no, we don't know yet. The pro housing grant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Haven't heard a word. Is there a timeline? Uh, December 31st of 2023, and then it got moved to the end of January of 2024, so no. <laughs> I think that HUD is giving out so much money that they bid off more than they can chew with the applications. Um, and, and some people from our, our federal delegation have said, yeah, don't expect an answer by their timeline of January. So. Any other updates? Thanks for asking that time. I know too. <laughs> I'm doing a report out on that too. I'm sure my gateway can so. <laughs> okay. If there are no other updates, is there a motion to adjourn? Pat? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy this lovely afternoon. Have you in.